Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Culture. We are an anti-imperialist international media collective. And today I am joined by my friend, Mike Goldfield, from a country that does not exist. And my very good friend and historian, Aaron Good, who is gracing the show today to talk to us a little bit about JFK. How's it going, Aaron? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I just watched Looking Glass for the first time last night, the Oliver Stone's new documentary that's kind of like covering the facts he couldn't get to in uh, the 90s movie. And it was it was a hit. It was a hit. Yeah, good. I've, I've seen it a couple times and um, I watched it once by myself and then once my mom was here and we watched it. And you I found out I found out that she had seen JFK in 1963. Um in really? Charleston, in Charleston, West Virginia, for the uh, she was in high school band, I guess, and uh, he was there for this the centenary of the you know the state's founding, um, and then he died a few months later. Um, oh, and shit. also the and also the congressman that she worked for voted for the JFK Records Act in 1992. Yeah, wasn't that a unanimous vote? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, how's it going, Mike? How'd you enjoy taking the JFK pill? <laughs> Uh, pretty good. So I, I think I read uh, the Garrison uh, book maybe 15, 20 years ago. So it's nice to get back into this, especially with um, the news that Biden um, <laughs> was sealing uh, more documents related to this for everybody's own good during uh, during the pandemic, um, even though everything was supposed to be, I guess, um, released within four years back in 93. So um this is uh, going to be a very educational for me. I'm looking forward to hearing a bunch about it. And I'll probably be inter interjecting with uh, the, the neophyte uh, kind of question every so often, uh, just to kind of uh, uh, get myself up to speed and also understand how this affects uh, things uh, moving forward and affects us still. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Because like we, we have two, we have an expert here and then we have a, a casual expert here and we want to get into some some juicy details you might not get other places but we don't want to leave anybody behind um but i'll say right off the bat what we're not really going to talk about today is kind of like the salacious like history channel shit about jfk right like stuff that's already reasonably disproved like the magic bullet uh like stuff about jfk's personal life like and we're not and what we're not going to do today is kind of promote like the bleeding heart JFK narrative, like the JFK was just some peace loving hippie and it was like such a tragedy for humanity that he died. But we there there is certainly a reason why we're still talking about this 60 years later. Um, and I think this the continued uh, sealing of the, and delay of the files kind of speaks to that. But uh, if you would like. Uh, some sources and, and further readings on on this topic. We're going to definitely recommend some at the end, um, but we're going to start from the perspective of our audience who probably reason like a, relatively uh, aware of a lot of the stuff that went on and, and kind of buys into the fact that there was a conspiracy of some kind. And we're going to kind of break down, go through the historical context and then get into some uh, oft forgotten details of uh, JFK and then the Warren Commission and the aftermath. Um, so that brings us into a good question. Like, why why now for this movie, right? Like, JFK came out, the original came out in, in 92, right? And that was such a huge deal that it got Congress to, you know, push forward the release of the files because they weren't going to be released until 2039 or something right uh 20 yeah 2029 i believe was yeah. the the big ending there in uh, jfk all the government files get sealed for i think 75 years is the is the standard um so, so like why and also like why does the jfk conspiracy still have so much like wide appeal and staying power like why why is it still so deeply deeply felt like what do you think about that aaron well, part the, a big part of the problem is the evidence and the circumstances are so it, bizarre that people were suspicious of it right away. I mean, the person that they arrest for it gets murdered in state custody. The most important prisoner in the U in U.S. history gets killed in a room full of cops, um, and he himself said, "I'm a patsy." And then the guy that did it came up with some weird stories about it. And eventually he also said that he was forced to do what he did by really powerful people. Um, and, you know, these facts come out as well. And so it, 
the whole all of the the circumstances are very strange. In 1975, the public sees the Warren Commission for the first time, or I'm sorry, the Zapruder film for the first time. And at, after that, support for the the low nut version of the story, you know, that that Lee Harvey Oswald did it falls to single digits. It, nobody believes it. And so it, peop, that's a that's a big part of it. And then also because it leads to it's right before Vietnam, there's that question, which is was this somehow related to Vietnam? That's one of the things that Stone got crucified for in the media. And ironically, it's one of the things that there's more substantiation for now than there was back then. A lot of other historians, you know, mainstream historians even have said, yeah, Kennedy was pulling out. I mean, I, I personally think that the debate has been won by the Kennedy was pulling out. And even people who were worked in the Johnson administration, like there was one of his national security people uh, in an exchange at the nation who said, yeah, the policy was uh, at the time that uh, of, of Kennedy was pulling out of Vietnam, but he, but, and then this guy goes on to argue, well, he would have changed his mind, but that's what, the, that's what some of these people are arguing now. They're not even saying he wasn't pulling out. So it, that part's been established as well. So it's a, has huge consequences. And also I think because the direction of America is clearly bad that, you know, people want some explanations for it. And the Kennedy assassination kind of offers some insights into our political predicament, you know, in a number of ways that make it really worth studying. Yeah. And I, a lot of people, especially after the, the Trump era have been, you know, br bringing up new questions about um, uh, the state of American democracy and, you know, the, the, the overreach of, of certain, you know, factions within U.S. society and the U.S. government. But this is kind of, if you really want to talk about democracy and the, the interferal, interference with, like, everything that our country is supposedly founded on, JFK is a pretty good place to start. And I think that's where a lot of the danger lies, is that, you know, if the truth of this, of this event were to come to light, it would reveal uh, a much deeper... Uh, system that, you know, exists completely separate from and unaccountable to the rule of law. And I think it would really shake up a lot of people. And so that's uh, precisely what makes it dangerous. But I don't know, Mike, like what kind of sense, what did you learn about JFK growing up? Like, does, do Canadians, I mean, I know that Canadians are like fucking into QAnon somehow, so at least they know about JFK that way, but what what do you, what do you guys think about this up there? Well, from the outside, um, the PR uh, surrounding the United States uh, permeates worldwide at all times. So there's this shining city on a hill that they are, especially. I was born in the '80s and like through the '90s, of uh, where they won, they smash communism. The the system works. Um, uh, they are benevolent, like world policemen. And anything that you were to kind of question uh, that narrative at all, it would always be like, oh, that's heavy conspiracy theory. Um, all of these that no, no, United Fruit wasn't uh, act like running as a dictator in like South America. They're not using other countries as just single crop uh, cash crop um, countries. Everything isn't just feeding into the American system. They're actually benevolent. They won World War II, all of these things. When you have a situation, and uh, especially the movie JFK, like I remember it coming out when I was really young, uh, it counteracts that narrative. So anytime that narrative is has something that pushes back on it, it creates a lot of interest. And um, especially for something that was so public and uh, in your face, um, especially with all the events leading up to 1963 that had happened, keeping missile crisis, Bay of Pigs, all of these things come out into the open and it really acts as a good like learning tool uh, for what the U.S. actually is and kind of gets from the, the fraud uh, that, that is used in the entire system for it. So one of the things that I find interesting about this is what leads up to it and also the players that are involved in it and how kind of class... Uh, pressures and coercion led to this and it wasn't just an absolute hey uh you're this is a you're not doing what we're saying or you owe the mob money kind of thing 
there's a lot of financial interest that went into this and kind of ties into how the whole CA operates and was established in the first place. Yeah, we're definitely uh, going to get into some historical background here because for, for as much as uh, Fukuyama kind of gets like memed uh, these days, I could I could understand kind of like especially the Cuban Missile Crisis in the early 60s is kind of a, a feeling that you are at the end of history, right? Because World War II, you kind of the origins of the Cold War kind of lie in, in World War II and how the end game of that plays out. And then you, you know, like the whole story of JFK upends this narrative of, of the 60s as like an enlightened time of, of peace and prosperity and like, you know, a peaceful like cultural revolution within the United States and, and throughout the world. So like, I don't know, Aaron, do you want to do you want to get into more like the tying this back to World War Two and how kind of the, the CIA and everything gets established? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, this is a tricky thing to, to summarize. And I'll, I'll even if I, I'll, I'll try to do this as briefly as as possible. And in fact, I think I'll go against a little bit of what I said earlier and I'm going to take it back even further, but I'm going to try to do it quickly. OK, so, so the U.S. in its early part of its history goes from sea to shining sea. Right. We, we know this, the pilgrims and all that. And they just Louisiana Purchase, Texas, Mexican-American War, all this stuff. By the end, by 1900, it's see the it is see the shining sea, and the frontier is gone, which was a sort of source of like expansion and energy that was put into into that, and it was always an outlet for capitalism in a way, because you could always go west, but you couldn't go west anymore, except actually, turns out you could go west, and that's what they do in 1898. They fight the Spanish American War, which actually starts in the Philippines even though it's ostensibly over Cuba. Very strange, right? And then we take over the Philippines and set up an empire because it's lucrative for trade with China. Trade in the Pacific is very lucrative. So the U.S. goes west, sea to shining sea, and then instead of staying on the continent and then maybe, you know, working in a more kind of socialist direction where you try to boost the economy by having workers better paid so they can buy more of the stuff they make, they go for the imperialist route. And there's a conflict over that, but the anti-imperialists lose. And so the U.S. goes on an imperial route, but it's still a little bit reluctant to be a full-on empire. Okay, Eventually, you get World War I, and the U.S. enters in a pretty imperialist fashion after it's been bankrolling the, the allies over there. And it looks like Germany might actually win the war because they defeat Russia in, the, you know, in 1917. And then the U.S. enters in militarily, and, and Germany loses. OK, and they put all these debts on Germany. Germany can't can't pay. The U.S. creates all of this credit to allow to loan money to Germany so that they can pay the allies so the allies can pay the America back. And it is an untenable situation. But the U.S. insisted on keeping the debts in place. And this causes all this, this unstable system and a massive amount of credit created to keep it going and a stock market bubble that goes along with that, which bursts of when they lower the interest rates at the U.S. Federal Reserve and you have the Great Depression. And in the U.S., the response to that is the New Deal, which is sort of socialism light, but still saves capitalism. And in Germany, they go for fascism uh, and in Italy, too. And in both of those countries, you had support from American and Anglo-American elites helping the rise of fascism in Italy and Germany. And of course, Russia is communist, so they're not really liked at all. They're despised by the American ruling class until FDR recognizes them. And then there's a, a sort of a, an alliance between in world during World War II, but the Soviets are allowed to bleed a lot and suffer a lot in the fight against the Nazis while the US mostly sits on the sidelines. Soviets really win World War II, as you know, Haley, and even and the US, but the US emerges in great shape. The US loses 200,000 people in the Pacific, 200,000 people in Europe, which compared to Russia is nothing. Russia lost 26.6 million people fighting the Nazis. So that just that 0. 0.6 is more than the U.S. lost fighting the entire war. And they got a whole lot of their country destroyed. But the U.S. enters World War II deciding that the, the ruling elite decided that they were going to enter, you know, the Council on Foreign Relations and the War and Peace Studies Project in conjunction with the State Department. They formulate all these plans before the war even really breaks out. And they say, we're gonna enter the war 
and eventually we're going to win because we're the most powerful country. And, you know, maybe the, they didn't even really know if the Nazis might defeat the Soviet Union or not. But either way, they were figuring they were going to have to carve out an empire uh, uh, over what was left. But hopefully it would be the, the whole capitalist world. And so that's what they do after World War II. They, they do exactly what they said. The Council on Foreign Relations, one of their members, Henry Luce of, of Life magazine, writes this famous essay, An American Century, where he argues for U.S. hegemony over the over the global capitalist system, although he never says capitalism, they always say free enterprise. It's always freedom, 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 freedom. Okay, capitalism is not called capitalism. It's always freedom, democracy, and freedom, and free enterprises is, is accepted as a part of that, which really just means capitalism and property rights. Although he does say Wall Street are America's fascists, which you couldn't get a politician no. to say today. No, he doesn't say that. But that's the counterpoint to, to to Henry Luce, Henry Wallace. Oh, sorry. So you're, but you're exactly right. That was, and I was going to get to that too. So that's good. Henry Wallace is the counterpoint, and he is the vice president of Harry Truman, and he's going to be the not the vice president in 1944. Except they, they, did I say, uh, yeah, FDR is vice president. There's a coup, and they remove Henry Wallace, and they put in Harry Truman mainly just because he's a pliable. Schmuck. Yeah. Yeah. product okay. of the Pendergast machine and, and then yeah so yes. like just the, for people who are skeptical to call JFK a coup there was a coup in in 1940 in 1945 uh, as well or 44 yeah, 40, 44 yeah yeah so yeah. They, they they put they Wallace wanted something different and he was closer to Roosevelt's heart I think I, I Roosevelt was a ruling class dude himself very wealthy um, you know, went to Groton or Groton, however you say that, which is like the number two school in America for high school kids. And his family was the Delano family, made, they made their fortune trading opium. OK, so this is a respectable American thing like the Forbes family did also Henry Cabot Lodge's family. But anyway, Roosevelt seems to not want to go this imperialist route, even though he was from that class. He was called a class trader. They even tried to overthrow him at one point, uh, you know, that whole business plot thing. But they don't succeed in doing that, but it doesn't matter because he's going to die. And they remove Henry Wallace. Henry Wallace said, this shouldn't be an American century. It should be a century of the common man. And America should allow technology to, get, to be shared throughout the world to improve people's lives and, and create a peaceful, prosperous world uh, and to allow hum human civilization to grow to like new heights, peace and prosperity, okay? Because America had this sort of technological know-how. Well, other people said, no, 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 we've got all this power. Why don't we use it to make some money? Okay, that's essentially what the CFR, you know, Council on Foreign Relations people said with Henry Luce, Time Life as like the American, you know, propaganda flagship of this whole effort. So that's what they do. They go for global hegemony and they create the institutions. This all got planned out by the C by the Council on Foreign Relations and that study group of a World Bank, IMF to manage the payment system of this new capitalist system. Even the United Nations plan was hatched out uh, during this time period. Yep. And some of the parts of the War and Peace Studies project where they did this planning are still classified, but it's suspected by people like Peter Dale Scott that these secret um, sections of the study are arguing for the need to create something like a, an intelligence service, like the CIA. At any rate, the CIA does get created in 1947. The Cold War begins, you know, I, I would argue that it was really America's fault and that the Soviets didn't want conflict because they just lost 26.6 million people, but Americans did for different reasons. So the CIA gets created in 1947 as a place to centralize the intelligence so the president can get all this stuff from one source. And then there's a little paragraph penned by Clark Clifford, uh, a Wall Street connected dude, uh, who was also with the government, was the defense secretary under uh, LBJ. And in the 90s, he goes down uh, in his 90s, I think even as part of the BCI bank scandal. So he's a very shady fellow in many ways. But he puts this one little passage in the National Security Act that says, but the CIA will also perform other duties as determined uh, from the, by the National Security Council from time to time, you know, in the interest of national security. So what does that mean? No people sign it. What does it mean? So just to stop you there quick. Now, <clears throat> when the CIA was created, there had been other intelligence um, agencies used in the U.S. However, it was just at wartime. 
uh, basically. And any uh, of those incursions that you were talking about before, like Cuba or anything or Spanish, anything that was done pre-World War II, usually the entire military was involved with, uh, with that uh, rather than in a Candlestone fashion, correct? Yes, there was not a dedicated intelligence service, and especially not one that was to function overseas. There was the FBI, which evolved during the 20th century, kind of takes on a more sinister form uh, in during the Palmer raids after World War I, where they round up all these com these alleged subversives and so on, saying that uh, there's, a, you know, after the Red Scare, really, the original Red Scare, after uh, Soviets, Soviet communism prevails in Russia, and there's a lot of labor uprisings. And so there was a domestic kind of intelligence uh, aspect. And that's why Hoover was actually against the creation of the CIA. But during who led, who was the director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. But the OSS was created, the Office of Special Services, I think, right? Uh, during World for as a World War II agency. And, and uh, Hoover really wanted that disbanded. It was led by this guy named William Donovan. Uh, and it was... And for a time, Alan Bellis ran a sort of private version of it uh, out of uh, out of some offices. I think it was maybe called The Room or something like that. Uh, and it was just really an Alan Bellis project um, run, at, uh, you know, under his guidance. And he was a Sullivan and Cromwell attorney, you know, the biggest corporate law firm in the world. And eventually these guys lobby enough to get Truman to agree to this Central Intelligence Agency, and it's lawyers from Dylan Reed, uh, which is a huge Wall Street firm, investment bank, and um, Alan Dulles is also one of the main people behind creating the CIA. Yeah, um, and, and Dulles was, uh, via his work through the OSS, was already, you know, undermining FDR and fucking him over in that he explicitly disobeyed his, his orders to go negotiate the surrender of uh, German troops in Italy. Uh, behind behind FDR's back. So even within the OSS, uh, he, he, he wasn't just doing any of the stuff he did out of like a personal disdain for JFK uh, or something. This was just, he has a long and storied history of kind of undermining uh, and subverting diplomacy and democracy on, on behalf of, of usually uh, moneyed interests and Ex yeah. of humanity. Exactly. The, the, these are people... Sullivan and Cromwell represents the pinnacle of the American corporate elite. And for these people like John Foster Dulles, who was Eisenhower's secretary of state and Alan Dulles, who was Eisenhower's and then Kennedy's director of central intelligence. For these guys, the interests of corporate America are synonymous with the national interest. That is their conception of the national interest. And to endanger those interests is treason in their eyes uh, and just is not to be tolerate. They think that the, they know better about how things should be run. And democracy is just sort of a, something you got to manage in order to, uh, you know, get people to go, get the public to go along with it. But really, corporate interests are what got to be, have to be looked out for. So John Foster Dulles and uh, Joe Kennedy were both chairman of the SEC or, or high in the SEC at, at some point, right? I don't know about what, what John Foster Dulles did for the SEC, but um, Kennedy's father was um, the chair of the SEC. He may have been the he may have been the first one. It may because it was created under FDR, and he may have been the first guy to actually head it. And this was because sort of, sort of the logic of it takes a thief to catch a thief. That he had made a whole lot of money off of insider trading and other shenanigans on Wall Street. He's described as a bootlegger and mob connected character, and I think you couldn't help but have some connections with the mob, but I think some of that stuff is, is exaggerated and that he really made a lot of money on wall street, you know, on the stock market and running the movie distribution business, uh, in America. Like he had a, he had a great either like sort of a lock on one angle of the distribution of movies in Hollywood, which was a huge business. And he just made boatloads of money that way, but he wasn't a wasp. He was, you know, Irish Catholic guy. And he was always a little bit of an outsider uh, in, in those circles, even though he had risen really high. Um, so, yeah. That's, that's just that's just like ethnic profiling to tie him to the mob like that. I'm saying that like I don't have family who are like bona fide Hell's Kitchen Irish Mafia. But <laughs> well, I, what I what I mean is that it, to do business in that time period, especially if you were really going to try to be 
you know, an upstart. The, the mafia was intertwined with the, econ- the political economy of the United States. It's not like you have the good people doing, the, doing their jobs and following the laws. And then there's just a few people that, that it's the mob and they're the bad guys. And if only we could stop them. It's like there's many connections between the overworld of private wealth and the underworld of organized crime. And that's, a, that's, a, that's always been the case in America. It's almost a symbiotic relationship, you know, like people wonder where the CIA gets all the money to do this shit besides the the massive uh, federal budget. And that is through things like the global drug drug trade, like in in modern times. And uh, I remember on your Trunon episode, you got into like this, this crazy, like secret gold stash that uh, uh, Ed, uh, Ed Lansdale. At the at Lansdale found and then just use that to, to fund all manner of, of operations in Southeast Asia. But I digress. And, and every, everywhere that that's the that's the source of funding for the ruling party. They have a slush fund and it, it's come out in a few scandals over the years. The LDP was established with one hundred and seventy five million dollars worth of like diamonds and platinum that were obtained by a class A war criminal who should have been executed. And he created, instead, he they sprang him from prison and he set up the LDP, which is the party that rules. Japan's essentially a one-party state and only a few times people from the other party uh, run it. And it was established by this, it was essentially a CIA cutout, a CIA cutout, the party was. So it's sad for Japan. Yeah, that's some real Indiana Jones shit. My God. But well, thank you for, oh, go ahead, Mike. Well, it, it also goes to a lot of like the initial capital accumulation that happened in the United States, which opium played a massive role in that and organized crime as well. Um, it was part of the movement of capital and the, the circulation of it. it is entwined in it. And so any of those, and it's really important uh, to tie Dulles uh, right to um big business uh and with the the inside of that uh, legal firm is that everything was turned into how can we accumulate more capital at all times and that was kind of like the guiding force for everything that started moving forward through the 50s and uh, the 60s and you can remember all i've seen like united fruit ads where it's <clears throat> they're really pushing out how great bananas are and how they get to you but they always leave it the part of um why those bananas are there and uh, where they're coming from and the conditions that they were coming from. And this goes into kind of Cuba with sugar, all those lovely things. That process of accumulation is sold to the American public that if you work hard, that, that you too can have this. However, the majority of all billionaires and especially anyone in the ruling class at that time, they all cheated to get to where they were like, and it's all a fraud game and it's kind of sets up everything uh, for uh, like a, a next level of exploitation after World War II, after the U.S. isn't touched at all. Exactly. Um, but I want to, so we've gone over kind of like the financial underpinnings of like the forces that that come out against uh, JFK or that JFK tries to, tries to rein in. But I wanted to talk a little bit more about like the emergence of the Cold War and like this nuclear panic that, that starts after the end of World War II. Because like when you think about it now, most Americans don't really think about the existence of nuclear weapons on the day to day. They usually don't care or, or think that Hiroshima and Nagasaki were, were good and moral things and just leave it at that. Um, it's kind of exited popular culture, except for, you know, as it's like uh, used as a mechanic in video games, like when you get a, a 20, 10 kill streak in COD and you get a tactical nuke and stuff. <laughs> But um, there at this time, like from the end of World War II to like through the 60s and and really to to the collapse of the Soviet Union, there is this like underlying um, like existential fear among everyone in the world. But even even in Americans who, you know, were were the only people to use nuclear weapons in wartime um, and. There's and it, and it really comes to a head in the early '60s when you know international. There's still a chance to to rein in uh, the arms race and to potentially avert a cold war. Although I I would argue that it had already started by the atomic bombings, the way World War II ended. And you can trace it back to like Wilsonianism and his uh you know 14 points versus Lenin's like April theses. But 
Um, so like, but it's important to, to, to realize, uh, like, and people talk about Kennedy wanting to end the cold war, rein it in. We'll talk about how true that actually is. But at this time, like most major players in the military and intelligence circles, like wanted full blown war with the Soviets, or they at least thought that war was inevitable. Right. And the USSR was on a path to world domination. And like, how does this become policy? Cause that's pretty fucking insane to somebody who knows anything about like the state of the Soviet, the early Soviet Union, and especially after World War II, right, when they've been absolutely decimated. Um, but, you know, George Kennan's long telegram is kind of the first inkling of, like, we're planning for war with the Soviet Union. But the long telegram was kind of like, we need to anticipate some sort of war or conflict on every front, right? Like, we're not, we're not planning like a formal military intervention, but it's like, okay, so we need to think about on, on a cultural front, we need to be culturally superior to the Soviets and, and here's, here's what they've got going on there or like on the commodity production front uh, because that was like a major crux of like, you know, the kitchen debate and, and why people felt that, you know, the U.S. had cultural superiority during the Cold War was that we had all this cool shit you could buy. Like, look, wow, you can put a fridge in your house now. Um, but uh, the, the long telegram is more is is pretty toothless compared to what follows it a document called nsc 68 which is written by paul nitza primarily who i think was ellsberg's boss for a time um is that right aaron i forget yeah yeah, yeah. they they I, so i just wrote i i'm doing a rewrite to uh my dissertation as you know and um one of the things i just wrote was a section on the creation of the of the military industrial complex. So it was George Kennan who sent the long telegram from Moscow. He worked for the State Department, and his boss was Dean Acheson, who is like I think really up there with Alan Dulles, except in a way he's kind of loftier than Dulles. Dulles has to actually get his hands dirty, whereas I think you know if you're looking for like the voice of the establishment during this period, the voice of the American deep state, it's it's Dean Acheson, and he wrote containment. This containment doctrine is contained in. Uh, George Kennan's long telegram, but he was really, uh, you know, carrying out what his boss wanted him to do, uh, Dean Acheson. And this sort of st helps to set the stage for like a Cold War mentality in the United States and that the Soviets are this terrible foe that are bent, hell bent on domination, which there's a lot of projection there because it's the U.S. that's really thinking about all their investments all around the world. And Stalin is mostly uh, wanting to consolidate, you know, the regime at home and and in Eastern Europe, but for the for reasons that are logical in that Eastern Europe was where the Soviets had twice been invaded, you know, by Western Europe, the Germans, to terrible effect. And so it's logical that they would not want unfriendly governments in, in Eastern Europe, but for the U.S., we spin that as their imperialism. And it probably did suck to live under, you know, Soviet communism to some degree, although, you know, neoliberal, whatever, <laughs> hasn't maybe been much better, but that, I don't want to open that can't learn there. But so NSC 68 is in 1950. And it's it's not something that happens in isolation. It's in 1947 and 1948 and 1949, there are events. There's a war scare. 1947, you have the National Security Act. 1948, you have this war scare that's ginned up in, in large part to save the aerospace industry. So they they ratchet up tensions with the Soviet Union in order to allow for a massive influx of government funds to save the aerospace industry which it had been doing great during world war ii because of the military but then was really tanking and in danger of like of of just going belly up and also had creditors like chase manhattan bank the rockefellers were like the biggest creditor of this industry and that's like you know the most powerful those are the most powerful entities in uh, u.s capitalism and so they gin up this war scare. This is they've got this problem of how you know they could have nationalized these things, or they could have repurposed, you know, the, these manufacturing uh, capabilities in order to build up the civilian economy and create the great infrastructure, lay the basis for something that might become high speed rail. But no, no, you can't do that. They military spending is the thing that they settle on again and again, and they do this in 1948, and it works, and then. In 1950, they were a Paul Nitz's boss, Dean Acheson, again wants to go even further than containment, and it's really this thing called rollback, or this like more aggressive kind of proto neoconservative position, which is a really hardline militarist stance. 
And they argue that the Soviets are so evil. We need a massive military buildup. We need massive, um, a, a massive effort to counter what they do and not be bound by laws and morality and other things. Because it doesn't right. matter if we violate our morals or, or values because it's communism is so bad, we got to do it. Yeah, it's proactive, not reactive. And the important thing about the, the shift with NSC 68 is that it, it explicitly states that the Soviets are out for world domination when there is absolutely no evidence to suggest that unless you buy into the whole Soviet aggression in Eastern Europe. But that's that's predicated on ignorance of the, you know, the agreements of, you know, the spoils uh, of, of World War Two for the Soviets laid out at like Tehran, Yalta. Um, where, you know, and, and at, with the percentages agreement, you know, like the only meeting that, that Churchill and, and Stalin had privately where they kind of carved up uh, Eastern Europe, uh, if, you, if you pay attention to what countries uh, the Soviets got, uh, places like, I think, Greece, Hungary, uh, I mean, there's a lot, and I'm, I'm forgetting most of them, but a lot of them fall either, either they, the Soviets didn't get them to begin with, end up getting them to begin with, or they pretty soon after the end of World War II start start falling um, to to uh, like revolutions or you know like Western backed coups and stuff. And actually, that's where the Truman Doctrine comes from. Is that he says, you know, okay, well, let's go out there and uh, squash commun the communist up the KKE in Greece. Um, but the the one of the addendums to the to the percentages agreement was that. Uh, you can't like Stalin can't interfere. You know, if if, there, if somebody if there's some sort of uprising, it goes some way. Stalin can't ha can't have his hands in anything to prevent that. So the Soviets are just kind of watching. You know, they they got screwed out of with the atomic bombings. That was the real purpose of the atomic bombings was to screw the Soviets out of their spoils and, and dominance in in Asia. And then on on in in Europe, you have the same kind of thing happening. So they're just watching themselves lose territory that they feel they need legitimately as, and, you know, perhaps they are justified in feeling that way that they need it as a buffer. Yes. Uh, St Stalin agreed not to, at the percentages agreement, he agreed not to get that, that Greece would not be in the Soviet orbit. And that when there was that civil war that you point out in Greece, he, the, the U S intervened heavily, the Soviets did not. And yeah. in fact, the, it was it outraged Tito in Yugoslavia that the, so that Stalin was taking this position. A position which led to a rift in the communist world between Tito and Stalin. And so Tito goes into that non-aligned camp, even though he's a communist. And of course, Stalin is in the, you know, communist Soviet bloc. Yeah. So Stalin, like as a show of good faith, is trying to adhere to the the, the shit terms that, that he ended up with. And then it causes further rifts and, and ideological divides within like the communist bloc, so to speak. Yes. Well, at that same time, um, all of the um, kind of underground um, resistance fighters or anything to do with old uh, German intelligence was getting absorbed by the, the United States at the same time. So when you hear a lot of the anti-communist rhetoric that's being used and even the, the, what you guys have referenced there, that's just old like boilerplate Nazi um, kind of rhetoric and propaganda that was used. And then you have things like Gladio uh, getting set up. This crushes, uh, helps crush like, communist victory in italy con like communist victory in greece and instead of denazifying totally in in germany all the basically all the that brain power quote unquote uh is absorbed back into the united states and used in uh, the form of capital and attack on the soviets moving forward as well so right. while you're creating the cia you're also using uh using all of that uh, old uh, Nazi brain power literally to fight communism. And uh, that's kind of where the whole uh, idea of allying with the Nazis after World War II kind of comes up uh, globally. Yeah, Germany and the way Germany gets divided is key at this time, right? Because that's where all the NATO nuclear bombers are, are sitting, ready, ready to strike Soviet Union. If they ever so much as, as, as tiptoe into, you know, what was decided to be American or Western territory. But, so, so all of this nuclear, like, like nuclear aggression, nuclear potential nuclear standoffs are, are the, the groundworks being laid for those. Um, and there's, and you know, like the Berlin airlift happens in like 49 or something like that, I think. Um, but there's like, 
in at home there's a massive like public and and like international like outcry to like nuclear buildup and kind of the way the world is is being divided because uh you know I keep I keep talking about Stalin, but Stalin's vision for like a, a post-war diplomacy was that it was going to be centered around nuclear weapons or, or nuclear technology and the sharing of that nuclear technology to create like some sort of global anti-fascist alliance. And what ends up happening is that most of the allies went and, you know, took took all the Nazis and, and you know, started building it back up again or or allowing the last of it to fester. But so in response to all of this, you know, like, uh, there's like the the creation of SANE, uh, like the first major anti uh, nuclear group. Um, Adlai Stevenson is really like on the anti nuclear train. Uh, Nehru uh, in India is is decrying this, and uh, so in response, Eisenhower starts pushing like the idea of the peaceful atom and nuclear energy, which you know, as we if we talk about brinkmanship for a second, like that's just complete and utter bull. But um, so there's there's a lot of wacky shit, things that range from wacky and Looney Looney Tunes tier to like straight up things that could end humanity that are being very seriously considered on on the table, uh, like during during the lead up to JFK's presidency. There's stupid shit like Project Plowshare, we're gonna set off nukes underground, like Project Chariot, we're gonna nuke the polar ice caps to like make the world a little bit warmer, which is doubly funny now, but um. So, they wanted to. They wanted to detonate a nuke on the moon too. Yeah, that was like after the Soviets like won the space after Sputnik uh, like wins the space race. We wanted to like put nuclear silos on the moon and also like nuke the moon for. And then Carl Sagan was actually on the team that was supposed like supposedly studying that, and he was just like, "What? The, why the fuck are we doing this?" But like, you know, Eisenhower is regarded as. Um, uh, I mean, I mean, Truman was kind of just happy to to do whatever and he he got too big for his britches after uh you know dropping the atomic bombs but eisenhower is more regarded as like a, a very level-headed statesman you know an, an honorable guy who, who reeled in the the military budget for for the sake of the public good but eisenhower you know privately was seriously ramping up uh the arms race and, and the cold war i mean he took the united states from and, and, you know, this is important for JFK, too, because JFK runs on this idea, this myth of the missile gap, right? That because the Soviet Union had the first successful test of like an ICBM, but in reality, they didn't successfully test like warheads to attach to it to deliver until a couple of years later. And the United States, you know, with all their uh, bombers and stuff in NATO had uh, far stronger, you know, nuclear capability at this time and, and pretty much always did throughout the cold war but uh, so eisenhower took the us from approximately like a thousand nukes to thirty thousand or so by the time uh 1960 or 61 rolls around all by all by the time all the nukes that he approves actually gets made there's about thirty thousand uh which is the equivalent of like 1.3 million hiroshima bombs which is insane to think about because you only need a dozen or so of them to to cause like a mass extinction event um, but Eisen, what, another thing Eisenhower did was he greatly expanded, uh, he, he subdelegated, uh, you know, the nu nuclear authority and, you know, increased the amount of hands on the nuclear button. So he granted NORAD and the Strategic Air Command uh, the authority to launch nukes if the president had been incapacitated um, or if contact was cut off. Right. And that's the most dangerous one that we'll see come up a lot during the Cold War is that there's a comms blackout. And, you know, the, the guys in the missile silos fear the worst and they, they really think that they should do it because, you know, they think that the world's about to end. Um, but, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, the, so the nuclear issue with Eisenhower is another kind of unfortunate consequence of um, events that happened during that time around in SC-68. So I just want to establish this because the military industrial complex is, is important and it's the reasons for it being established are important as well because they, they figure in U.S. history up to the present day, really. It's that in an SC-68, if you read it, they're not just talking about the Soviet Union being so so evil. They, they are, but they're also saying that they're acknowledging that even though the Soviets got people around the, the Washington acknowledge that even though the Soviets got the bomb in 1949, it didn't make any, they, they weren't looking for a fight with the US and it really didn't change the, the danger level for the United States. 
but they do talk about the dollar gap. And what, and what they mean by that is like, in Europe, is Europe going to be able, we're giving them all this martial aid money, are they going to be able to buy the things from us to keep this system going? Because we don't want them, if they don't have this martial aid money, they may become neutral, meaning that they may trade with the Soviets, they may trade with the U.S., and that would not be the, in the U.S. plan. The U.S. wants to have hegemony over the, the capitalist world. They want trade flows to go across the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean and for the U.S. to be the center there. So that's why they established Japan and South Korea and Taiwan as for, for capitalism early on, you know, versus especially once China becomes it's, the revolution is won by communists. So th that happens also in 1949. But the thing that they talk about in, in, in SC68 that I think is key is the dollar gap. And so they make the decision they, to rearm America in a massive military campaign. The U.S. will run deficits and that this will help to facilitate trade. And it will also create the environment with Western Europe and, and in the U.S. to keep people anti-Soviet. So right. it's a way to make sure that they stay in the U.S. camp. You ratchet up anti-Soviet, you know, hysteria, and you spend a lot of money on weapons. And this uh, gives a boost to the economy, like the like World War II did, because the economy is starting to tank. Also in the U.S., it's, there's labor uprisings and other things because they need you needed government intervention into the economy because otherwise you you don't have enough demand and so well, they could have gone for full employment and a, a great investment in infrastructure and other and higher wages for everybody but the elites didn't want that they went for the military industrial complex and this is done in part to manage global capitalism to ma manage global trade but the military spending gets kind of out of control and it's a huge part of the budget. So Eisenhower wants his new look foreign policy, which is going to rely less on, you know, building a bazillion bombers and everything else, although there's still a lot of those things being built. And he's going to rely more on nuclear weapons, number one, and number two, covert operations. Because really this the Cold War is is fought in a bloody way after after World War II, mostly in the global south. And it's a way to deal with the issue of decolonialism, decolonization, which the U.S. is ostensibly for. Even Eisenhower, you know, like Eisenhower intervenes on the side of Nasser in the Suez crisis because they needed credibility in the third world so they could say, hey, we're not the colonizers. We're America. We're not the imperialists. We're the country that revolted against empire. Right. This is the propaganda. And so Eisenhower puts more money into building nukes and trying to, to not have as much military spending to get this military industrial complex under control. He's not totally successful. And then when he leaves office, he says, you know, and, and, and Eisen, under Eisenhower, you have the CIA really running wild in places like Iran. They kill uh, Patrice Lumumba in the Congo. Um, they try to overthrow Sukarno in Indonesia. They overthrow the, the leader in Guatemala, the, the president, right? This, that's the, the heyday of CIA covert operations. Yeah. And Kennedy, and Kennedy takes office and he's running as a cold warrior, but he also speaks about the need for countries not to be imperialist in the third world. Like he criticizes the French. He criticizes Eisenhower and Dulles for supporting the French in Algeria and, and Vietnam. So and he also talks about disarmament even in his earlier even in his earliest speeches. Like he's talking about nuclear war as this dangerous thing that we've got to avoid. And he was talking about peace even before the peace speech, even while he also used a lot right. of anti-communist rhetoric. Yeah. So that's, that's the position that he's in when he, when he takes the White House with help from CIA connected people about things like the missile gap and so on that gave him information about this that he used to defeat Nixon by running to his right a little bit. Yeah. And this, you know, um, this puts Kennedy in a position where they don't they don't know exactly how he's going to do, but they think he can be managed. The national security people think he's going to be managed. And the first test they give him is really the Bay of Pigs thing. Yeah. So it's interesting. It's ironic how Kennedy runs as as a cold warrior who wants to escalate with Cuba um, and escalate it, uh, against the USSR and uh, close the missile gap that actually doesn't exist. Uh, but, you know, LBJ, he's bookended by LBJ and uh, or you know, after LBJ and Nixon, they both run on ending the war, which, and, you know, before they even take office, literally while they were on the campaign trail, they had already made backroom deals to extend the war. And I, I wish we had time to talk about Nixon's whole thing uh, with, 
uh, running uh, and, and, you know, uh, sabotaging that conference, but um, before, so yeah, we're not here to say that JFK was some sort of like enlightened guy who wanted to end the Cold War. Like he was a Cold Warrior, but he well, had a- he did want to end. He did want to end the Cold War. I'm gonna. I, he, I think he was trying to end the Cold War. He, yeah. that, I, I think he recognized it as a structural impediment to everything that he wanted to do. He had back channel talks with Khrushchev and Castro going on when he died. When he, as soon as he got assassinated, Castro said, this is bad news. If you saw it in the movie, I think they include that in the movie. He said, this is bad news. Everything has changed. Because yeah. Kennedy, you know, the, the CIA was trying to kill Castro. Castro didn't believe that Kennedy was doing that. He later tells Jackie Kennedy that. Jackie Kennedy tells Castro, I, I know, you know, my husband wasn't trying to kill you. Still argued about today because CIA people like Sam Halperin said Kennedy was trying to kill Castro. But those plots were done ordered a hit on him at, at least it's you can't prove a negative so I, I will grant that you can't you, you know it can't be proven that he didn't but there's no evidence that he did and there's a lot of evidence that the people who are trying to put forth that narrative are not to be trusted um so what do you say to that but right. so so this was Ken, uh, kennedy was you know his peace speech his his back channel talks to um castro I, and, and to Khrushchev, I believe that he was wanting to end the Cold War. And he was taking, he made a speech to that regard saying, you know, he, he for the first time, a US president acknowledged the massive suffering of the Soviets in World War II, which he says was unmatched in human history. Uh, he said, we all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And he said, the kind of peace that we seek is not a Pax Americana forced upon the world by American weapons of war. Okay, this is, dramatically different from what other presidents have said you know obama wins the nobel peace prize in 2008 and he gives a speech where he says you got to accept that war is always going to be with us well kennedy wasn't saying that he was actually saying we can't accept the idea that war is inevitable that's a defeatist way of thinking and that humanity needs to you know advance past that and we've got to look to ourselves also and not just blame everything on the soviet union so I think he was trying to end the Cold War, and that was not popular among sure. people who hold power in the United States. There, there's a separate question of can the Cold War be ended, but just before, um, I want to, I think there are two major things uh, that, that kind of reverse his, his stance as a Cold Warrior. Um, and I, I think he gave his his speech at American University, the the, the one that Oliver loves to show and in, in every single thing about JFK where he's talking about ending the Cold War. Um, but so he he sees uh, this this plan called PSYOP, uh, which is our like strategic initiative operate. It's basically like our formal nuclear plans, like in the event of nuclear war. Um, and then obviously the Cuban Missile Crisis um, and a similar thing happens with with Reagan. Um, kind of kind of towards the end of the Cold War where they have this kind of like reckoning and then all of a sudden all all they're doing is trying to prevent uh, a nuclear war. But so the like strategic national strategic target list, this thing called PSYOP, uh, the very first one uh, was approved by Eisenhower and then, you know, was going to go into effect under JFK where, you know, there was this they were planning a simultaneous strike on the Soviet Union and China with the goal of like maximum destruction. And the Joint Chiefs estimated a death toll of 100 million dead in the USSR, which is, you know, uh, five times what they lost in World War II. Uh, it, five, 100 million dead in the USSR and China, my mistake. Uh, 100 million in Eastern Europe and approximately 100 million in Western Europe just from fallout. And it didn't even include an estimate of deaths from like a retaliatory strike on the United States. Um, and you know, Eisenhower said privately that it scared the, sh the shit out of him or s scared the devil out of me, but he approved it unaltered. And everybody in the room ultimately was like, yeah, this seems reasonable. Uh, and you know, Ellsberg calls like these sorts of plans and then the sub delegation out where so many people could potentially enact them like the doomsday machine. And that's really what it is. And like, Military brass were continuing to push variants of this plan, uh, most notably at, at the end of 1963. Um, and so, you know, obviously Eisenhower's reputation as like a level-headed diplomat, you know, in light of stuff like this, 
uh, is pretty undeserved. When you think about like brinkmanship and just how many times he was threatening to nuke, you know, Korea and Kamoi and Matsu and and even uh, Suez. Um, well, they wanted to. They wanted Dulles wanted to give nukes to the French to use at yeah. the Indian Fu. It's Operation Vulture. It was called, and the the French were like. Uh, no, <laughs> you know, we can't. Oh. We can't use them without. If we use them, we, we can't figure out a way to use them without killing our own people, and it would it would look bad. Yeah. So no, no, we're not going to do that. So it's you know it was yeah, no that was wild. And th let me add a couple. Th let me add a couple things about the psyop. Number one, it was the it was a plan for general war, and it also stipulated that in the event of anything above a skirmish with Soviet forces, it would the Americans would go to general war. And the plan for general war was to nuke all of Russia, you know, every place where they suspected there were missiles in all the major cities. And you know, going along with that, you would nuke China. Yeah. Okay. Just because they're communists too. Giggles, yeah. And and they didn't know that this would also lead to nuclear winter, which would kill everyone. And Ellsberg yeah. found out about this and he went to, uh, he went around his supervisor's heads uh, to get this information to McGeorge Bundy, who was not aware of it. The president was not, Kennedy was not aware that this plan existed until Ellsberg actually went to McGeorge Bundy uh, and, and got this to him. There were there were directives in the Pentagon saying you were not to mention this plan in any communications, or you'll be given a punishment of us. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like this is not to be done because it is not to be even known that this is the plan. Presumably because if some civilian leaders found out about it, they might want to change it. We can't have these these panty waists changing our glorious plans. You know, to go down in the ball of you know nuclear fire. So. This is how insane these people were. And Ellsberg went around his head and Ellsberg gets charged with uh, not. I mean, he gets given the task of coming up with a new plan, which he completes the first draft of at age 29. because He's a pretty smart guy. He comes up with the new plan, which he's happy about. But then he finds out he discovers later with through the you know scientists findings that even his plan, if it had been carried out in nuclear war, would have also led to nuclear winter and killed everybody. So. Yeah. That's something it's, that the Rand guys didn't figure out until far too late was that you can't like uh, there there's no like way to logic and reason and and like kind of contain something that is you know basically just absolute chaos incarnate like you're just you're just letting death death itself loose on you know countless countless people there's no way to kind of like strategize and like min max that. And the Rand guy, you know, like that was a problem with Kennedy's like cabinet was that he brought in a bunch of people who were like veritable geniuses, but they had no like common common sense about this kind of stuff. It was well, they, 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 yeah, they, they were subjected to the cosmology of the people in charge. So like McNamara is the poster boy for this a brilliant analytical mind, extremely competent administrator. And under Kennedy, he tries to carry out the policies that Kennedy orders, including the Vietnam withdrawal, right? Yeah. And this is key because it, this was not known until after Oliver Stone's movie and John Newman's book. And I, I've interviewed John Newman for the Covert Action podcast series that's coming out for Destiny Betrayed, you know, the JFK thing. And he talks about what how his book got written. John Newman wrote JFK in Vietnam. And he was speaking with Robert, Ma John, Robert McNamara about all of these things, and including the fact that McNamara was being lied to by the, the people in the, the Pentagon. They were giving him bogus reports and McNamara didn't believe it. And, he's, yeah. and it's pretty dramatic description by John about this whole exchange. But eventually, because John Newman discovered all of these things in the records about Vietnam and JFK, it leads to Robert McNamara writing his own memoir where he admits, yes, for the first time, that yes, we were trying to get out of Vietnam. And this makes McNamara look really, you know, it's it's not like this is self-serving for McNamara because it raises the obvious question, well, why did you try to get out of Vietnam under Kennedy? 
surreptitiously, but very deliberately, you know, trying to cir circumvent what these CIA and Pentagon people were doing. Why did you work so hard to get out of Vietnam under Kennedy? And then under Johnson, you just, you, you prosecute the war, you know, and McNamara would, was responsible would be like, well, if, if we hadn't been there, the, the military people were much worse. It could have led to nuclear war. And, you know, he might even be right, which is a, a scary thing. So this is the, you know, this is the, the situation with these, the Pentagon and, and, uh, and these people at this, this time period. And Kennedy had smart people, but he also had a lot of people connected to like the Rockefeller, Rockefeller's fund and all of these establishment people that, you know, were not necessarily loyal to Kennedy and Kennedy's vision. So this was, yeah. even his administration was a compromise with a lot of forces that were really diametrically opposed to them, especially those connected to like the military industrial complex the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, uh, and people that were opposed to what Kennedy was doing. Yeah, and we'll we'll break down the Vietnam question um, in a second. But I just I did, I oh, did have ahead. a quick question as we're going. So there's a lot of <clears throat> rhetoric about um, kind of uh, JFK's uh, f uh, kind of bucking against. Uh, the trend of everything. And we did talk a little bit about uh, Bay of Pigs. He did run an anti-communist uh, like campaign to get elected in 1960. Uh, obviously, uh, Cuban Revolution happens in 1959. Um, Eisenhower signs a uh, kind of uh, something for uh, um, uh, colonialism in like Africa. They have things going on with that. The CIA has their own job that are they're going with Bay of Pigs, training exile units to be coming in. One of the one of the things they still went ahead with Bay of Pigs. Uh, he feels he was lied to by uh, the CIA during that about uh, their capabilities and uh, like even Dulles um, um, intentionally um underfeeding him and intentionally uh knowing that he, uh, the the strategy they were using was going to fail to um kind of spur military action overall was there a from 1960 to 1963 um gradual changing of kennedy's uh views on things to where he was trying to close out the cold war because it doesn't look from uh um an international perspective and uh like uh, up here from canada that initially that's what he ran on and it was always a danger to it i feel uh there's probably events that kind of led him to those views by 1963 that happened and maybe you could get into that a bit Bay of Pigs was definitely what started put him on this trajectory and i was actually going to get to that next so yeah if you mind breaking it down a little bit for us. I mean, you 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 said some of the main uh points of it, which is that he w this plan was developed under Eisenhower. Nixon was essentially the action officer for that. Kennedy inherits it and he's told that their prospects for success are good and that they won't have to it, military intervention won't be required because they will land and then there'll be an uprising and so on and so forth. Well, he was lied to about this and there wasn't and and they expected Kennedy. It was really like a covert operation where the target was the president, and the president was expected to be faced with either defeat or U.S. intervention. And it was expected that he would intervene, and you would get this invasion of Cuba, and it would be a, sort of a disaster for the U.S. in terms of its like prestige. It would seem like a you know colonial bully, but it but the die would already be cast, and then he would be committed to this but policy. Cause it wasn't just like Dulles's good, good sense that it was going to fail. Right. Like he had Intel on his desk that was like, y we can't take out Raul, Fidel and Che just with this operation. And the, you know, the, we can't guarantee that there will even be this like spontaneous uprising that, that they were backing on to kind of just take young Castro. But well, and all they had to do was light the match. Right. Right. Yeah. And so Kennedy gets outraged by this failure, but he accepts that this has happened. And he says, you know, goes on TV and says, uh, victory has a hundred fathers and defeat is an orphan. Right. Well, so he takes responsibility for this. And surprisingly, his approval rating goes up and the public like appreciates his honesty somehow. And maybe is happy also that there's not a war in Cuba. 
But he says at this point, I'm going to smash the CIA into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds. And he fires the top three people at CIA. Um, Alan Dulles, the director. Dulles and... Bissell and Cabell. Yeah. And, and Cabell, I think it's Charles Cabell that he fires. And then Earl Cabell is the mayor of Dallas, who was also a CIA asset when Kennedy gets assassinated. Can I so stop these... you for a second? Because I, I keep asking, like I texted I texted Peter last night and I was like, so did he actually actually say the whole like I'm gonna scatter it the CIA to the wind? Uh because like the, the earliest I can find that quote is in the New York Times in like 66 and it's attributed to an anonymous uh source and, and a couple of things about Kennedy and then about his assassination are are have have sources there. But um I, I, I want to believe he said it just because, A, that's, that's a badass quote, and I know that it's like similar to things that other people said in history, but B, um, it tracks with a lot of stuff that he was saying, even, even in regards to Bay of Pigs that he was confirmed to have said about the CIA and like you know how he wants to limit its power and how he thinks they're all sons of bitches and, and bastards. So that leads me to believe that he might have said it, but I just I, I can never get a decisive well, word on I mean. It. And the Times, the Times does not err on the side of printing unfavorable stuff about the CIA. If it was printed in the Times by an anonymous official, then the anonymous official would have to be credible, or they wouldn't have printed it. And if, and on top of that, he fired Alan Dulles, which was sent shockwaves through, you know, the establishment there. So uh, I, I would have to. The veracity of that quote is, 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 I mean, it's. It appears in a lot of history books, I'll say. Yeah. It's what, what what complicates this issue too. So after all this, okay. So personally, he uh, he is feeling this way about the CIA. Uh, takes these actions against the, their leadership, then signs an embargo by executive order against Cuba in 1962, and this is a couple months before the Cuban Missile Crisis. So all. Even though outwardly, even uh, he's having a power struggle within his own, uh, within the state with uh, another organization, he's still following out with uh, uh, American imperialism against uh, against Cuba. And really, what um, kind of what you'd be looking at as, as an outsider is what is the what actions did he take that differed from uh, like the line that was like the the way things were already moving already. Okay. This is, this is good because I think this is really the heart of it. If you want to understand why. So you had Kennedy uh, with those Sullivan and Cromwell inspired, you know, people that are holdovers from Eisenhower and you have the policies of Eisenhower. Well, Kennedy Eisenhower wanted to get rid of Sukarno. They made plans to assassinate Sukarno, who was the leader of Indonesia, right? They tried to, dis the CIA tried to discredit him by, uh, creating a fake porno movie where he has sex with this blonde woman who, who uh, they have an actor who's wearing a Sukarno mask and they make a video like, look at this, how terrible it is. He's a Russian, he's compromised by the Russian spy. But then it turned out this, the Indonesian people didn't really care. Maybe they even thought it was cool, you know? Yeah. And, and so they never actually distributed that video. Um, okay. But they did try to overthrow um, Sukarno or foment a rebellion there, which which falls apart when a pilot crashes, kind of like with you know uh, Gary Powers in the U two or Eugene Hassenfuss in Iran Contra, right? This guy named Alan Pope crashes, and they can't lie anymore. Well, it's eventually Robert Kennedy under the Kennedy presidency who is sent over and negotiates the release of Alan Pope, and also is friendly with Sukarno. Sukarno and as Indonesia is. Indonesia is one of the most resource-rich places in the entire world. That's why the Dutch were there for hundreds of years. They made, you know, bucket loads of money by exploiting the Indonesian people. It's really why Japan, when Japan goes for Pearl Harbor, all right, their plan is to knock out the U.S. presence in the Pacific, especially so they can take over Indonesia and you have oil and Java and all these other minerals, and they wanted to set up their own empire. So this, this, this issue of the material wealth of Southeast Asia and Indonesia is huge. Kennedy came out against the French presence there, uh, but he inherited an American presence in, in Indonesia, in Vietnam. He also was friendly to Sukarno. He was planning a state visit to Sukarno. There's a story that's in Greg Polgrain's book. He's an Australian historian who's done a lot of work here, where Kennedy and Sukarno and Jackie 
they have to go to the bedroom in the White House uh, and they tell Sukarno that it's the only place that's not bugged by the CIA, right? And Kennedy helps Sukarno, actually facilitates the nationalization of industries that are owned by Western corporations, okay? And under Johnson, there's a bloody coup in Indonesia that we're not, we can't go into, but like Johnson reverses that policy and puts in a dictator who's a U.S. puppet, which was Kennedy supported Sukarno and third world nationalism. In the Congo, because Kennedy takes office and the CIA knows that his policy is different than Eisenhower's and he really supports uh, African nationalism and supports Patrice Lumumba, CIA with its friends in Belgian and English intelligence, British intelligence, they kill Lumumba. Uh, quickly and they move on this after the election in all likelihood because they knew kennedy's policy was different so that's why you have that famous picture of kennedy with his head in his hand on the phone going oh god this is terrible news because adelaide stevenson tells him about the assassination of lumumba okay but he but tries did that from him what's that the the cia hid that hid the yes of yes they didn't they knew about this and they didn't tell him and yeah. additionally, his policy under there, he tries to diffuse the, the crisis in the Congo that emerges with Dag Hammarskjöld, the UN Secretary General, who also gets assassinated probably by these same people. And, but they, they are successful in stabilizing the situation in the Congo. But when Johnson takes over, it goes back to the Eisenhower, you know, Dean Acheson policy, which is, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm saying Acheson as like a, a a force of the U.S. establishment and imperialism, right? This sort of consensus of imperial imperialism, and they put in Mobutu, the the puppet of the as a puppet of the U.S., the guy who had basically killed Lumumba, the CIA asset, and he rules it as a, a dictatorship for thirty years, and the U.S. gets lots of, you know, enormous amounts of mineral wealth from that place. So that's one area where he differed. Additionally, in the Brazil. 1963, Kennedy is told that David Rockefeller wants to have a meeting with him. Kennedy says, ah, I don't want to, no, nah, I got to go. And, <laughs> and he dodges him and he, because he knows the meeting is going to be about overthrowing Gulaire in Brazil. And so he he he, he, he avoids him. Okay, he, he doesn't want to overthrow Gulaire in Brazil. But, of course, in 1964, CIA you know, and friends and, and Johnson administration, they overthrow Gulaire, put in a military dictatorship. So you just think about those three countries, which are the three of the most resource rich areas of the world, the former co formerly colonized world, Brazil, Indonesia, Congo, uh, and they're places that are still today being looted by right wing forces of capitalism backed by the U.S. Uh, with, with horrifying effects. Uh, and there you see the difference. Kennedy didn't the CIA's mission in the third world was with a pretext of communism to go out and make the third world safe for it, uh, capital for yeah. American for Western I mean, capital. Kennedy was tight with the guy who coined the term third world. Like he was tight with Nkrumah. No, so that was, that was Sukarno. That was, oh, uh, oh, my bad, my bad. But he did like Nkrumah too. And like, Nkrumah is another case where Johnson overthrows Nkrumah. The CIA yeah. under Johnson gets rid of Nkrumah also. Kwame Nkrumah. First independent statesman in Africa. Nkrumah's watching all this shit play out and he writes neocolonialism. Yes. And, and that it, makes them angry. That makes yeah. the CIA angry. So they overthrow him. And then, yeah, in 65. But uh, so I I mean, Kennedy inherited the the embargo, right? Because it's it actually starts under under Batista. Um, under but, Eisen, under Eisenhower. Yeah, but it but it's it's it starts uh, when Batista is still in power. Right. No, it's it's the response to Castro nationalizing Amer what U.S. Okay. interests. So Batista I'm, wouldn't have done anything to warn an embargo. He was a loyal. But it know. starts in 59 and then Kennedy expands it. But I don't. So, yeah, that. And I, he launches Mongoose, too. Kennedy launches yeah. Mongoose, probably the biggest mistake of his presidency, perhaps. And yeah. this is a, these are operations against against Cuba. He's yeah. stuck between having to do this Cold Warrior you know, business, because it's such a, it's, it's a structural reality in the U.S. that you have to be anti-communist, you have to be doing shit, right, against communism. That's the way I, I take it. And so he commits advisors to Vietnam, but no ground troops, even though they want him to. And he allows Mongoose to go forward, which he does eventually uh, stop after the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Cuban Missile Crisis is sort of a response to this, these fears that they might invade. And Kennedy diffuses that but it really pisses off the military brass. And this yeah. that's, that's, the, that's in 1962. 
after the Q, after October 1962, Kennedy takes more steps to ratchet down the Cold War, but he has to walk a fine line between making the world safer, less likely to be exploded, you know, in nuclear death, and you know, still uh, adhering to the Cold War consensus, not being able, not being somebody that they could paint as like soft on communism. Yeah. So he's really running as president for a democracy where a lot of insanity prevails. And, and for him to come out and say, you know, we are, we need to examine our own attitudes with the Soviet Union. We need peace. We, we got to be realistic about it. Let's work towards disarmament. These were pretty serious, serious things. And this, th these upset a lot of powerful people. Let's, Let's go right to a couple months before uh, the 22nd of November, 1963. Um, you touched a little bit about uh, the speeches he'd been making uh, where, hey, yes, the Soviet Union did make a great sacrifice in World War II. This is, we can talk about this openly, obviously. The, what were kind of... Uh, what was the month and a half like uh, before um, the date of the assassination? And what maybe even bring up a little bit about um, Chicago and Tampa in the lead in to uh, Dallas? Okay. The, the, the Tampa one, I don't know much more than is actually in JFK revisited. Um, so I, I can't say much about that, but there were plots against Kennedy, but in those last few months of Kennedy's life, uh, one of the more significant things he was doing was attempting to orchestrate the withdrawal from Vietnam. So he sends uh, his sec his joint his chairman of the Joint Chiefs um, Max uh, Maxwell Taylor, along with Robert McNamara, to Vietnam on a fact finding mission uh, in the, in the in the early fall. Maybe it's in September of uh, or August of 1963, and they come back with a report except they didn't even really write the report. The report was written by L. Fletcher Prouty, who is played by Donald Sutherland in the movie JFK, and uh, General Krulak, who was his superior. And it was written at the direction of Robert Kennedy and really at the direction of John Kennedy, who told them what to put in this report. So they get off the, the plane, they have this bound report handed to them, and they go, all right, here's the report you just wrote, and that's the report. And then in October, the decision is made to issue in Sam 6 263 which calls for a withdrawal. It says, as per the recommendations of this Taylor McNamara report, we're going to withdraw in six, in a thousand troops now and uh, the rest by the end of 1965. And a secret, an, an, another memo that's not declassified until after the JFK Records Act is issued by Maxwell Taylor. And it makes it very clear. It says all planning is to be directed towards withdrawal from Vietnam. Okay, this runs counter to what people like Chomsky say about how everything was only conditioned on victory and that Kennedy was never prepared to lose Vietnam. It was that wasn't the, the wording at all. It was very clear in early October that is issued that report is issued that says all planning is to go towards withdrawal uh, and the withdrawal schedule that Kennedy has laid forward. At the same time in October, you have what what appears in the New York Times and this, the Washington uh, Washington newspaper by a reporter named Richard Starnes. Uh, it might have been, I think it may have been the examiner, yeah. And it says the CIA is out of control in Vietnam and uh, they represent a force unaccountable to no one. And if there's ever a seven days in May, it'll come from the CIA and not the Pentagon. That was a reference to the movie Seven Days in May which was about a the military generals overthrowing a liberal president who was trying to make a deal with the Soviet Union, you know, a sign a peace treaty with the Soviet Union. And it was a novel that Kennedy wanted made into a movie. And so he had his press secretary, uh, Pierre Salinger, actually contact John Frankenheimer and say, please make this into a movie. I'll even arrange to go to, uh, you know, Massachusetts so that you can film in front of the White House to make this movie because it needs to get out there. This is, the generals really are crazy. They may attempt something like this. So please make this movie so to warn the American people, you know? And so on the day Kennedy's killed, there's an ad for this movie that's supposed to appear in the New York Times, uh, which, you know, then Kennedy gets killed. So his warning doesn't even, doesn't even matter. So that's in, that's in October. 
And in early November of 1963, November 2nd, there's that Chicago plot, which seems to be a dry run or, or maybe it was actually a plan A for the assassination. Kennedy was supposed to go through uh, a parade route in uh, Chicago, you know, the presidential motorcade route, and he was going to take a hairpin turn, just like the one that he took. And there was an ex-Marine there who seemed who seemed mentally unstable and was being manipulated in some way and placed in that building overlooking the hairpin turn. And a bunch of, uh, you know, presumably Cuban people were arrested but it, uh, about this, uh, and they were found with sniper rifles and so on. Um, and they were interrogated by Secret Service, but none of those records exist. They let they, they were. Let two of them, they let two of them get away. Um, and then the other two stonewalled them and they didn't press them further and they didn't take down any of their information. Right. Uh, but there, is... there was like a trifecta, basically a plot for every week in November of 63, first in Chicago, then in Tampa, then in Dallas, that all followed roughly the same plan and they all had a pansy attached. Um, and you it mean, was all you mean Pat, Pat's down. Patsy. Patsy, like sorry, Pansy, yeah. Patsy. <laughs> <laughs> they all had a random uh, gay man. It's uh, they were I mean, it on the gays. Yeah. It wasn't, it was a communist. They had a yeah. communist Patsy, not a gay Patsy. Yeah. Oh my God. Whoopsie. Um, but they, yeah. So, and it, and it was all centered around uh, parades with, uh, you know, a vantage point in a, in a high building with a, with a high powered rifle. So they, they were basically just trying the same playbook over and over and over. But um, it's I how they killed, it's how they tried to kill uh, De Gaulle, except it wasn't with a, a convertible. Yeah. They had crossfire. They had crossfire. People lined up to shoot at De Gaulle and it was his own intelligence service. And De Gaulle gets, he has a flat tire in his Citron that he's driving, but his driver is apparently a badass and gets away. But you can see pictures of De Gaulle's, De Gaulle's um, car all shot up. Yeah, Kennedy has like a very funny history with France, right? Because he's against the, the French the French war in Vietnam and, and their stuff in Algeria before anyone even knows, decades before anyone even knows that we were funding that shit the whole time. Um, and then, you know, he tell, didn't he tell that one ambassador or something that he thought that, you know, there was a, a, going to be an attempt on his life or something? Um, he could have. He he talked to, I know he talked to De Gaulle, and this is in the movie too, I believe, where it, he talks control. to De Gaulle about the assassination attempts because De Gaulle says, uh, Monsieur, the, your CIA it's is trying not. to kill me. And he says, well, I didn't give the order for that, but, you know, I, I can't really speak speak for CIA. They could be killing you. They might not be. I don't know. It so, takes, it takes guess is as good as mine. It takes talent to maintain the monotone when doing a French accent. I respect it. But I wanted to ask you, because people uh, harp on that JFK like expanded troop presence in, in Vietnam before he tried to roll it back. But wasn't that uh, just the clause where it was um, something like, oh, we're only going to have experts or advisors on the ground? Like, was that? And then in they theory. Just, the shit out of the advisors clause just to keep putting the same the same boots on the ground. Yeah, they they added a lot. He added like fifteen thousand or so advisors. It wasn't fifteen thousand, but it was around that number. And they were there supposedly there to train, but they did end up going into combat. And he also authorized the use of defoliants, as I understand it, not Agent Orange, but he did. And he was asked about this by someone who was critical of the war effort, saying, "Why did you do this?" And his response was, well, you can't say no to your national security state all the time. <laughs> so, you know, it's, was he playing one side or the other? Like he, he said all different things to different people. And you could, so there's room to interpret these in different ways. Um, but I, I tend to think that, you know, he was trying to withdraw and enough people have come forward about that, that he was, it's just what he didn't want to have happen was a clear communist victory before the presidential election, which would lead to a red scare and potentially uh, not allow him to be reelected. So he left Americans there twisting in the wind, even though he knew it was a lost cause and he was not honest about it. He was dishonest yeah. because he believed that that was the politically shrewd thing to do, to make misleading statements and vague statements and to go forward uh, and, and allow the big decision to be made after he was safely reelected because right. he expected not to have his head exploded in Dallas in November. And then on the same day that the Chicago plot gets foiled or gets discovered November 2nd, um, you know, Diem gets assassinated, the, the, the dictator that we had installed in, in, in Vietnam. And he, you know, Kennedy wanted him removed, right? He, he approved plans to coup him. Yeah. 
but he, maybe, maybe, but he may not have. He didn't give the order for it to go forward. He allowed for coup planning to take place. To draft, yeah, he like drafted it up. But he was angry about the the cables that got sent. One guy he offered to resign, and Kennedy said, "Ah, you're not worth firing, and now you owe me." You know, over over this, and it was yeah. actually Avril Harriman and Roger Hillsman who sent the, the last cable that gave the green light to the coup plotters. And Kennedy, he he may have wanted there to be planning in place. Part of the reason, as I understand it, was that he wanted to be able to have put someone in there that would ask them to leave if DM wasn't going to, because right. DM was kind of all over the place. But then other opportunistic people manipulated events there for their own ends. Kennedy definitely didn't want him assassinated um, yeah. and was not, was very unhappy about the outcome. I but think he, he didn't even have a month to live. Time with DM, like, right. He wanted to see if he could, you know, be amenable to some kind of withdrawal or, you know, if he could get somebody else in there who would be. Um, but yeah, it, it wasn't, it wasn't his call. You're right. He just, he just a, approved, you know, plans to be drafted up and then sat on them. Um, but they were used without his, his knowledge. Um, but I don't know. How should we wrap this up, right? Because we didn't get to talk about Oswald because Oswald doesn't really factor in in more that he was he was the the patsy, right? Pat, I said it right this time. Yeah. In, in this, like trifecta of you know planned you know assassination attempts. Uh, well, let, let me let me say that since we don't have a ton of time. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and I could we could come back and talk more about the assassination at some date in the future. I have this uh, I, I have a number of things on my plate, so I can't stay too much longer today. Yeah. But I can we could I could maybe another 20 minutes or so. So when Kennedy is killed, you know, we could there are so many angles about the assassination you could get into. But I think, if you know, to be economical, one of the more important issues is, is why do they decide on this and how do they decide on this lone nut version of the story? So Oswald gets, arre gets is arrested, you know, in, in strange ways. The whole thing is, is very weird. But then he gets assassinated in, in prison or in jail as he's being transferred. And it just seems like a mob style kind of execution of some kind. Right. And Im the immediate response of this, because it looks very suspicious, but you have the acting Attorney General, because Robert Kennedy is sort of is not is sort of taking you know AWOL for a little bit. I won't say AWOL, but he's because he has he has leave because his brother's been killed. But the guy act you know the acting authority for the Attorney General in the Justice Department is this guy named Nicholas Katzenbach, and he issues a memo on eleven twenty five. Okay, um, about November twenty fifth, which is right after Oswald gets killed. He begun writing it the day before, you know, within hours after Oswald's death. And he says, the public must be satisfied Oswald was the assassin, that he didn't have Confederates who were still at large, and that the evidence was such that he would have been convicted at trial. And there's no way anyone would think that that was, would, would think that that must be the case. At the very least, you would think this really needs to be investigated. He's not saying that. He's saying we need to settle on this story now. So there had to have been power brought to bear on him to get this out there. Right. He says speculation about Oswald's motive should be cut off. We should have some basis for rebutting thought that this was a communist conspiracy or, as the Iron Curtain Press is saying, a right wing conspiracy to blame it on the communists. Unfortunately, the facts on Oswald seem too pat, too obvious. Marxist, Cuba, Russian wife, etc. <laughs> and the Dallas police have put out statements on the communist conspiracy theory. And it was they who were in charge when he was shot and thus silenced. So this is worth what they settle on right away as what's going to be the story. And LBJ gets persuaded by to, to go along with a commission rather than a you know congressional investigation or a, a investigation by the Justice Department, for example, which would have like Robert Kennedy in charge of, of it. And he gets persuaded by people like Dean Acheson and people right under him, you know, as in the sort of establishment hierarchy, like Joseph Alsop and uh, Eugene Rostow. And they, they lobby him and lobby him and lobby him. And they eventually get him to a point, a blue ribbon commission, okay, headed by Earl Warren. But Earl Warren is a reasonably honorable person and he doesn't want to do it. He's like, I don't want to, I don't want any part of this. No. And LBJ later talked about this whole episode of how he persuaded Warren. He says, 
I pulled out what Hoover told me about a little incident in Mexico City. Okay, an incident where Oswald is basically made to look like he's working for the KGB mm-hmm. as an and as an assassin. Okay, I pull out this little incident in Mexico City and I say, now, I don't want Khrushchev to be told tomorrow and be testifying before camera that he killed this fellow and that Castro killed him. And all I want to do is, is look at the facts and bring in any other facts you want in here and determine who killed the president. And Johnson said this about, about Warren. And he started crying and he said, well, I won't turn you down. I'll just do whatever you say. So uh, wait, he's wait, told. Wait. Neglected to mention is that Johnson had his dick out and he was taking a piss uh, and while he was talking to Earl Warren because he liked it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, he didn't do that. He did at another that. point, though. He loved he doing that. He did to a reporters. Reporters asked Johnson, why? How do you keep bombing Vietnam in the face of all this international opposition? And Johnson pulls out his penis and says, this is why, fellers. Yeah, literally, he just gave him the D's nuts treatment. Yeah, and apparently he had a big penis, I guess, um, re- reportedly, but I can't prove that. Anyone who but, owns an Amphicar is gonna be is gonna be packing heat. I mean, come on. Well, there's weird. There's like some weird audio of of Johnson where he's talking about these things, but he's like, "I want you to order me some more of these pants." Oh yeah, They're no, he perfect. literally called up Levi's and said. <laughs> too big to fit and that they should change the entire way they make their pants there's it's on youtube it's so funny yeah um, he, he says I, I like them these other ones they ride up in my bunghole <laughs> he, he actually says that and this is like our most enlightened like liberal pre- like this is the guy who like made the great society right well you know that we can get into that i think if you want to look at american liberalism as an actual substantive thing it peaks at the moment that you have the kennedy brothers along with Martin Luther King, organizing the march in Washington. They, Kennedy offered to speak there, and other people said, no, this is really like the black man's hour, and we don't, we, so, we, so thanks, but no thanks. And Kennedy was like, okay, but let's make sure we'll have the, you know, we'll work with you to make sure that this thing goes well. And it looked like civil rights was moving forward. So Kennedy was trying to move it forward. Kennedy was trying to get out of Vietnam, trying to end the Cold War. All these things were moving in a positive direction, and then he, he gets killed. Now, getting back to the Warren Commission and the significance of what he's telling Earl Warren, he's basically saying you need to squash all talk of conspiracy because it could lead to nuclear war, which would kill kill everybody. And Warren's in tears because he doesn't want to do this, but he does it. He also does the same thing to uh, Richard Russell, who comes across well in JFK revisited as the senator who was kind of a dissident uh, on the Warren Commission. Okay, he, so he tells Russell, this is a question that has a good many more ramifications than on the surface, and we've got to take this out of the arena where they're testifying that Castro and Khrushchev did this and did that, and kicking us into a war that can kill 40 million Americans in an hour. They get him to go along with this also. So the people, the part of the strategic brilliance of the you know evil plotters of this whole thing is they, they create a situation wherein the authorities charged with investigating this are led to believe that if they in, investigate a conspiracy, it will lead to nuclear war and kill millions of people. So which is the bigger evil? You know, not getting to the bottom of a one murder or, you know, taking actions that will lead to the deaths of tens of millions of people. And you can understand why they, they those people covered it up. Now, people like Dulles and other guys, that's a different story. But this, right. is, this is how the commission came to be. Yeah. And uh, I mean, Johnson was also the guy who nixed like the final end sam like what was it 273 that that stipulated that only south vietnamese troops were to be you know expanded um and he nixed that entire paragraph where it specified only south vietnamese troops because he said you know you you want your war i'll, I'll get you your war he he ran on he ran on the on the dove on the dove ticket there's that famous ad maybe i'll clip in here with the with the nuclear explosion going off and the little girl with the flower but uh that's what johnson ran on and while jfk was Lying cold, dead, and 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 laying and laying in state in the Capitol Rotunda, you know Johnson was, you know, fucking with everything he was trying to, you know, reverse at, at the end of his life. Exactly. Yeah. He 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 said to the Joint Chiefs, "Just get me elected, and you'll get your damn war," which they did. And he ran as a peace candidate. He ran as Goldwater was depicted as crazy and dangerous, you know, not for no reason. And Johnson ran as a peace candidate. The public did not want war really uh that you know they didn't but he did reverse in sam 263 he changes it 
that, that paragraph, he strikes it out. They do a great job. I use that same document in my classes. So they're on my PowerPoints and such because John Newman posted them to Facebook years ago and I, I copied them for use yeah. in class. But he gets rid of that whole paragraph and he replaces it with one allowing the U.S. to participate in covert operations uh, with the South Vietnamese, which puts the U.S. in the Tonkin Gulf, the USS Maddox, uh, on the night of the supposed Gulf of Tonkin incident which really they weren't even fired on. They were lying about they yeah. might have been fired on like they a couple nights before. Gulf Tonkin resolution before Gulf of Tonkin even happened. Like and, right. and Da Nang Da Nang happened even before that, I think. Um when they started like rolling thunder or maybe just right after. Um but the the one thing that uh Looking Glass didn't mention that I thought you might have some insight on was the disappearance of like Hal Boggs. Oh yeah, he his plane crashed in the '70s, and people speculate that it may have had something to do with the Kennedy assassination. It's yeah. not really, yeah. it's not proven. You know, there, it does. It's not even known exactly what he had, but there's been you know research uh, to that effect, and people you know do point out that he's another one of those suspicious plane crash deaths, like Paul Wellstone, um, John Hines, and John Tower. Two U.S. senators died. Like back-to-back -back days in 1991, which is really strange. Um, you know, there's Michael Connolly, the voting guy, the electronic voting guy died when they were, when he was yeah. saying he wanted to testify about how the 2004 election was stolen. So Hale Boggs is in that, that sort of pantheon of suspicious plane crash. Dorothy Hunt, you know, she died in a really uh, mysterious and suspicious plane crash. Like yeah, JFK well, Jr., you know, that's it. Uh, one of his mistresses, I think, who was like the wife of an of an army guy or something in, in D.C. was like murdered uh, pretty soon after he was assassinated. And people suspect that like he was telling her stuff that she she shouldn't have known. So there's like it's not just JFK. There's it'd be a dozen. There could be a couple dozen people who were like collateral in all of this, uh, let, you know, not to mention uh, in all of Southeast Asia um, and things like that. I think even Castro was like. I'll support Goldwater if it means that, like, fucking... If it would help you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but he told, yeah, he told Kennedy, I'll come out for Goldwater if it, you think it'll help you. In your, and, and, your and, like, life. Castro's no liberal, but, like, so bringing it back to, like, what we opened with, right, like, the, the delayed uh, release of, of the JFK files, uh, like, do you think they're going to be revelatory in any way? And, like, do, does it even matter? Because uh, it's got stuff like, I think, Oswald's tax records and, like, stuff about the CIA office in Miami and, like, details about the Castro assassination. So, like, why do you think they're still pushing it back? Yeah, I mean, they have all the time to scrub these things. And if they can get the president's autopsy brain pictures switched with the his brother as the acting attorney general, if they can pull off things like that, they can certainly scrub things out of those files um right. it's it's amazing that as much stuff has gotten through but it's because you know that they were able to make this movie with documents that came out from the jfk records act but it's, be it's probably because it's so intertwined with the like bureaucracy that they you know and for whatever reason they keep these these documents but it seems to be what is there's a book that's come out by a uh, canadian criminologist where he talks about an apex crime which is a, a crime where this, the state is obviously in charge of adjudicating crimes, but when the pinnacle of state power commits a crime, then there's very little hope that it can be investigated, except in a way as determined by the pinnacle of state power. And that fits very closely with what's happened with the, with the Kennedy assassination. So if these documents, if they reveal things, it would be very interesting to have David, or I was going to say David Harvey, William Harvey's <laughs> travel records because apparently he went to Dallas from Italy uh you know around in November of 1963 and some of these other documents that are that have been withheld but you know I, it could be that they will be scrubbed and edited you're talking about a uh, an entity with unlimited resources and power it seems and I don't know that they're going to ever give us the full story unless there's some dramatic change in the U S like an American kind of glass nose that would really want to, to deal with these things like a truth and reconciliation thing, which is what's being advocated by some people. Yeah. So there's like two things I want to drive home about JFK. And the first is that like 
JFK isn't, wasn't dangerous because he was some sort of radical or he was some sort of like a, like a leftist. He was dangerous because ultimately with things like, uh, you know, establishing relationships with Cuba, rolling back or withdrawing from Vietnam and, and at least putting the reins on the Cold War, possibly ending it. Though I personally don't know if the Cold War could have been ended at that point, but it, it was ultimately all because he cur was curbing the interests of capital and he was interfering with the interests of uh, American business because, you know, the military ultimately is, is acting on those interests as well. Um, and like my, Cuba is so important in this story, not just because of Bay of Pigs, but because Cuba is our playground up until that point. Right. And like 80% of America, uh, Cuban business, uh, I don't have the exact yeah, everything everything in Cuba was owned by the, by the oh. by corporate corporate America and the mob. Yeah, I found it. In in 1959 American corporations and and organized crime factions uh, controlled more than 80% of Cuba's mines, cattle ranches, utilities and oil refineries, 50% of its railways and 40% of its sugar industry. So like, right, I always talk about this at uh, Vietnam syndrome and how it kind of led to like the global wars on terror and like ap and our interventions in the Middle East, but you know, Cuba is kind of where the groundwork and, and some of the, the operations and strategies that we would eventually use uh, in Southeast Asia and in, in Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos were, were used. And so losing Cuba was not only a huge economic blow to us and to this to this deep state that's, that sources its money uh, from illicit means, but it was also just a huge blow to, you know, our our military's strategy and you know the the things that we were trying to test uh and just like subject cuba to and though and the world in in general they can live without the money in, in in cuba but there's a threat of you know the threat of a good example that they tried to crush everywhere as you see like with grenada and stuff like grenada is not important why would ronald reagan invade the country but it's if they revolt and you know are why are we spending so much money on nicaragua you know sanctioning them in venezuela and so on it's that you you could just as easily trade with these countries even if you let the government have control of the country's export monopolies you could be like okay we need sugar here's the money we're going to buy the sugar from you you could do all those things but other people, if they, if their people are allowed to vote for the policies they want in these third world countries, maybe even in more Western countries now, they would vote to, you know, would you rather vote for Jeff Bezos to own Amazon or would you rather vote to be an owner of Amazon? I mean, this is kind of an issue with socialism and the Cold War. Kennedy may not have been, you know, I am a Marxist, you know, say I am a leftist. I'm going I to say Marxist. leftist things now. Right. But the the materialism the the establishment does the extrapolations of like if you actually allow democracy to exist and without this you know crusading militaristic idiocy then people are probably going to vote for their own self interests and and and, and especially in the third world the people of the congo would vote to nationalize all their mines and use the money to you know help them escape crushing poverty the countries countries that do that like libya and gaddafi they raise living standards the highest in africa what ends up happening to gaddafi you know he gets sodomized with a bayonet and hillary clinton yeah. thinks it's hilarious like yeah. this is this is what they this is what they do you know right. and so kennedy what may not have been move like saying i am a socialist it's about time for socialism everybody but his policies were seen as you know especially ending the cold war as things that would and it would curtail the hegemony of money over American and global society. I think overall, and this is coming from outside of the States, um, looking at the Imperial Corp just across the border. What it shows is, is kind of what the limits of a bourgeois democracy are. And that even at the, the tip, the highest level of quote unquote power in it, you are not exempt to the to stopping the flow of capital at any time and what it is overall in that whole idea of a false uh, kind of a false uh, mystery to it 
is showing that no matter what you do, you can say whatever you want. It's what you do at the end of the day. And if you do anything to disrupt that flow, that recirculation, that capital accumulation, you will be taken out. Yeah. And it and it, that's the warning afterwards. And it led into a whole uh, like reactionary period and then directly into neoliberalism and it directly into the hell that we're in right now where it feels there is nothing you can do about it. And if you just get off that line a little bit, you will be you will be eliminated. And that's not just for uh, foreign operations that will be done yeah. here as well. <clears throat> yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Mike. Like that is, that is by design, uh, kind of like how the memory of JFK arose. Right. And that a lot of people think he was, he was killed uh, because of his symbolic power. Right. And not that he represented, he posed a legitimate obstacle and he was a legitimate threat to uh, like the capital and the interests of capital. Um, so I don't know. I always yeah, it's I, become a it's a pseudo sophisticated position that some people on the left like to say where it's like, oh, you know, I'm a you're not a structuralist like me. I'm a structuralist and I've mastered the dialectic and you, you just don't understand. You're not a structuralist. So, you know, that's wrong. Yeah. It's all about the structure. But the there's it, it, it's not over. It cannot be over determined that way. And that the, in that sort of mode of thinking, there's no one with any agency. But there are people with agency like. Well, elites, yeah. people with money and power have agency and they, they their job is not, you know, like, uh, you know, street sweeper or whatever. Their job is maintain and extend hegemony, accumulate more wealth and power. That's what they do. And they have money to hire people to do that. They create bureaucracies to do that. They create things like the CIA to do that. And they hire people that do stuff. They hire people that make plans, make secret plans, secret plans that are evil. OK, that, that, another word for that is conspire. That's what covert operations are. But there's this like pseudo sophisticated left who's like, oh, you think everything's a conspiracy? You think there's people in a room meeting, making plans? That's preposterous. It's all, it's the structure, man. It's the class structure. You need more class analysis. It's like, well, what do the people, what do the members of these ruling classes do? They, you know, they, they hatch their plots to maintain all of their power. They don't, you don't accumulate a monopoly over, say, petroleum like John D. Rockefeller by like, sitting atop the structure like it's a tectonic plate that's like riding you to ever greater riches like you got to be a real bastard and scheme and plow all the time and deal right. crush your opposition like that's well that's, even, what, that's what they do even marx will get into the two coercive of forces that capitalism runs on one is market domination and that's kind of an impersonal domination where everyone is in competition with each other and actions inside of that market uh, for you to be as nefarious and evil as possible you will be rewarded from that the secondary course of force on that is going to be in, in personal domination and this is people that actually own the workers and are on top of that they are making there's a personal domination to that so both of those forces are important and Marx gets into that directly too. Hey, here's all the factory acts, but here's what happens on the factory floor. Here's machinery. Here's how factories work. Also, here's how exchange and uh, the markets work. So both of those things have to be in there. What kind of JFK shows is like, here, here I am. And you kind of said it. It's like, here's peak American liberalism. This is doing, here's someone following the rhetoric to a T actually believing in it what happens when that happens it exposes the fraud that everything is built upon and you have to eliminate it because it ruins the actual gears that are getting pushed forward exactly like you'll notice that we're not really indulging in counter historicals here because you don't need to talk about what ifs to 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 uh, imagine why the jfk's assassination was bad it there is it created and enabled a very real historical process and a consolidation of power within this deep state and within the military industrial complex. And it fundamentally changed, you know, the American presidency. And that's why, you know, we, us as communists, we constantly harp on that there being no meaningful diff difference between Democrats and Republicans, because ultimately they all serve the same master. 
that's more true. It, it's definitely true now that there's there's very very little difference between them, and they're really captured by these forces. Um, and it's it, there's more to the story that happens after Kennedy. Yeah. But you know, think about his brother. What happened to his brother? His brother knew pretty early on that it was CIA with with mafia and Cuban exile help, but really CIA help uh, that, that or CIA that killed his brother. But he, he felt he couldn't even say it. He yeah. only told his confidants that. He said it once in public, finally, close to while he was campaigning the last months of his life, somebody at a big event, I think in California, said, are you going to investigate your brother's assass assassination if you're president? And he said, yes. But this was known to other people. And so they, you know, well, look what happens to, to John Kennedy with that. But in a, on another level, if you, you take it back, you maybe read in college, read Aristotle, his book, The Politics, right? And he set, talks about how different systems emerge and he talks about democracy, okay? And he says, democracy comes, you have oligarchy, you know, and it gets kind of corrupt and there's a little bit of instability the, the, and there's some unhappiness among the people. And one of, somebody within the oligarchy decides that he's going to take it, you know, rally the people to his side. Okay, that that's how democracy happens. And there are incentives for somebody like, you know, a Kennedy to do just that, to, to break with the ruling oligarchy and to actually attempt to respond to democratic incentives with the lowercase d um, and, and appeal to people that way. And that's why democracy is, is dangerous. And that's why Winston Churchill said, was asked about like the best kind of system. And he said, yeah, democracy... Uh, but de but democracy tempered with assassinations. Yeah, lots of and he said lots of assassinations. And Dean Acheson once quoted that approvingly in an interview. You know, so this is it. Democracy is good because it gives the U.S. legitimacy from a PR standpoint. But the people really in charge know that they've got to manage this system. And if somebody gets too democratic, then you got to take him out. Yeah. And and Kennedy's going into Vietnam was a disaster in that it destroyed the financial system that was established with the gold standard, which actually acted as a little bit of a constraint on what the U.S. could do in terms of spending. And it replaces it with this post Bretton Woods system after a lot of shenanigans, My cousin. Which, which gives the U.S. the ability to run deficits uh, and the rest of the world has to treat U.S. Treasury bills as being as good as gold. And so this satisfies the militarist, you know, military industrial complex people and the Wall Street people because the U.S. essentially has a Rumpelstiltskin money making machine yeah. in the in the aftermath of the Bretton Woods system, which Vietnam destroyed and which Kennedy was trying to avoid that outcome. Uh, he's trying to stabilize the system and not go to the Vietnam War. And there's a quote about John Kenneth Galbraith. Um, and it says this was written in a Nation article talking about. Galbraith's more liberal progressive economic policies and what Kennedy wanted to do. And he's, it, yeah, I'll read it. For Galbraith, a trusted advisor with unique back channel access to the president, a potential US war in Vietnam represented more than a disastrous misadventure in foreign policy. It risked derailing the new frontiers domestic plans for Keynesian led full employment and for massive new spending on education, the environment and what would become the war on poverty. Worse, he feared he might ultimately tear not only the Democratic Party, but the nation apart and usher in a new conservative era in American politics. So, so Kennedy saw these dangers and John Kenneth Galbraith also saw these dangers and they attempted to maneuver, uh, you know, to avoid these, these outcomes. And it was not successful and Kennedy's, you know, head gets exploded in broad daylight, high noon yeah. in Dallas. Yeah. His head just did that. We uh, we, we, we didn't have time to we talk about the. They, they fixed all that in post from uh, from watching the documentary. Like, yeah, we'll just put it back on. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I, I just thank you so much, Aaron, for being here. I wish we had six like, eight hours to talk about all this, and even that wouldn't be enough time. Really, uh, I really appreciate you being here. Love talking with you, and thank you, Mike, for for getting in all the good questions and giving us some from perspective and bringing it back to to class and to Marxism. Uh, that's the stuff that's kind of underpinning pinning all these events. Um, but do you have anything to promote, Aaron, on your way out? What's going on with you? 
Well, I have my, if you can find me on Twitter, you can find a pre-order page for my book and I'm launching a podcast very soon on uh, Covert Action Magazine. It's going to be a Patreon podcast and it's going to have an accompaniment to Oliver Stone's JFK Destiny Betrayed. I'm actually in the four hour version of that movie talking about, you know, C. Wright Mills and the power elite and Wall Street CIA connections. So I'm excited to see it. I haven't actually seen it. I'm a little I'm nervous to see it because I was so nervous when I shot it. I think I'm, I'm not going to look cool, but I'm OK. I'm happy about <laughs> it anyway. And uh, so people just just follow me on on Twitter. And, um, I, you know, I might be interested in coming back at some point in the future when these things settle down uh, for me and to talk more about this stuff, because it's always nice to see you even virtually, Haley, and good to meet you, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. You have an open invite on the culture. Thank you. <laughs>